Hi everybody and welcome to another video brought to you by plcgurus.net. So you're following along in what is the seventh installment in our Control Logics uh, PID Essentials video series. And hopefully you've been following along in sequential order. Uh, this series does require that you do follow along in the order in which I am presenting the videos to you. Uh, after you've gone through the video series once, by all means, jump back and forth to whatever ones you want. But I do highly, highly recommend that you do follow these videos sequentially. Okay, so assuming you have been following these videos in a sequential order, you'll know in the last video what we did is we we really configure what I would call the open loop control portion of our PID uh, loop here. And we also did do some testing on the SIM panel for the open loop control functions specifically. And I will include a download link if you haven't already done so and downloaded the SIM panel from plcgurus.net. I'll include a link in the comment section below so you can go ahead and do that and follow along exactly how we're doing it here. Okay, so what I want to do today really is is close up this loop. So like we said, we, we did we did wire up the uh, the open loop control portion, I would say. Now we want to go ahead and close this loop up. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop the instructions that we're going to need onto the designer surface here. And then once we've wired it all up, maybe work a little bit backwards and talk about each instruction that we're going to include in the closed loop portion, the feedback loop portion, and describe in a little more detail what the function of each instruction is and why we need it. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is head on up to the instruction palette here, and I'm going to go ahead and go into the process tab, and I want to drag this SCL instruction down. So this is a scaling instruction. So I did indicate in a previous video that we are going to be making use of the CV, the unscaled output of our PID enhanced instruction. Uh, by all means, we could use uh, the CVEU, the RD engineering or the engineering unit or the scaled CV output. Uh, but I thought, you know what, let's use the unscaled. Then we can look at um, another instruction in the process of of implementing this this PID control loop. Okay, so it will accomplish the exact same thing as the CVEU if we go ahead and scale it inside the instruction here as well. But let's just go ahead and do that just so we get some additional exposure. So the next thing I want to do is I'm going to go back to the favorites here and I want to drag down this add instruction and then I'm going to head back to the process tab and I'm going to grab something called the DEDT or the dead time instruction. Again, we'll step back and explain what all these things are. And then the next thing I wanna do is grab what's called the LDLG instruction or the lead leg instruction. So these instructions are purely simulation type instructions that allow us to simulate a real world process. And like I say, you do have to massage these things a little bit. Okay, so let's go ahead. So I wanna wire the input of the scaling instruction right up into our CV output, our unscaled CV output value. And maybe, yeah, that looks okay. Let's just leave it like that. And then I'm gonna wire the output of that into the add instruction. So the add instruction is gonna serve as a way to take our CV output and then add or subtract in a temperature disturbance. So we're gonna go ahead and need an input reference to do that. So I'm gonna draw, drag and drop the input reference down and wire that into source A. And we already have our temperature disturbance uh, tag configured. So we just start typing. You can see it automatically filters there for us. And we have our temp disturbance. So you can see here, we're going to take the output. We're going to scale that output value. So it's going to be an output value between 0 to 100%, meaning fully closed to fully open. We're going to scale that to indicate a temperature from 75 to 120 degrees C. And then we're going to either add a positive disturbance to that or add a negative disturbance to that, okay? So this is a way for us to inject a temperature disturbance, all right? So you can think of the temp dist as the ambient temperature in your factory. So on a very hot day, like it is actually today, uh, I don't know where you are, but where I am, it's about 40 three degrees C uh, with the humidity outside. So it's extremely hot. So it would follow in the plant, it's even hotter. 
So on an extremely hot day like that, it would be logical to assume that in order to maintain a set point of say 97.5 degrees, we are not going to need to put as much steam energy into the process to maintain that temperature because the ambient temperature is injecting or putting heat energy into our process okay so you can think of that as ambient and likewise if it's a freezing if it's dead of winter and it's minus 30 degrees c outside which is very cold uh, hopefully it, where you are it's not that cold but let's just say it is for argument's sake just to make this very extreme and it would follow that your plant is extremely cold so now the ambient is drawing heat energy out of your process and it would follow in order to maintain this same set point that you're going to need to put more steam into the process in order to maintain that because your ambient is pulling heat energy out so i hope that makes sense so this is what i'm talking about when we are talking about a temperature disturbance we can put heat energy into our process from an external source or we can be taking heat energy out of our process from an external source. And that's what that you know, that's just a good way to think about it. It's a nice easy way to think about it, I think. Okay, I hope that's clear. All right. So let's carry on here and let's go ahead and wire the output of our add instruction. So this is now our outputted plus our, our positive or negative disturbance and we're going to feed that into the DEDT instruction. And I want to talk a little bit more about these two in a moment, but for now, let's just wire them up and then we'll come back and we'll look at some, maybe some visuals to help explain what exactly dead time and lead leg time is. Okay. But for now, let's just wire it up. And now we want to take this guy and bring it all the way up to our PV, our process variable. And there's one other little thing that we're going to need to do here. And that is to make, assume this data is available. So when you mark this, so I'm just going to highlight that line and right click it. And you see there's an assume data available element. So what this does is tells this loop what the first instruction to execute is. So looking at the Rockwell user manual, the assume data available indicator defines the data flow within the loop. The arrow indicates that the data serves as an input to the first block in the loop. So this is why it's important to mark at least or one of the wires anyway in your feedback loop that the data is available because it defines the data flow for that loop. So as I said before, the DEDT instruction and the LDLG instruction are purely simulation type instructions, okay? Any real world process is going to have some element of dead time and some element of lead leg time in it. And so in order to accurately model a given or a real world process, it is important that we include these elements in our loop as well. And so that's what we're going to do here. So formally defining dead time, dead time is the time elapsed from the moment the process undergoes a change in its PV, its process variable, to the moment the controller takes action. So there can be many sources of dead time in a real world control loop. Um, these could become in the form of dynamic response of the instrument, propagation delays in the transmission of the signals, and delivery time of the manipulated variable to the process. So like I said, dead time is an undesirable element of the process. And when we're designing any type of control loop, it is important that we use sound engineering principles in order to mitigate or manage the amount of dead time in our control loop. If we have too much dead time present, then we are re at real risk or running a real risk of losing control of our process. So lag time is the time elapsed from the moment the controller takes action now to the moment the process actually undergoes a change in its PV. So this time lag in its most common form looks like a first order response. So if you've ever seen the response of a capacitor charging and discharging, a typical lag function will model or look like that same type of first order response. So this time delay represents a process's inertial time response to a step change. Okay, maybe it would help if we put up a visual. 
So looking at this trend, uh, we can see very clearly where the dead time is and where the lag time is. So you can see indicated in red is our controller output or CV. And you can see by the arrow that's indicating the step in the CV. So our controller output is responding. And, and we see here there is a delay in the blue or PV feedback line uh, before our PV actually starts changing, denoted there by T sub D. That is the dead time or the measurable dead time of our process. So now we can see the moment represented by the tau to when the PV starts changing to where we reach 63.2% of our overall change in our PV. We denote that as the lag time or tau. So five tau would, would represent the total PV change or where we're at 99.9% of our total PV change. Okay, so take a moment to digest this uh, this trend snapshot here, and I think it serves us well to really visualize where the dead time is and how we can measure that in a trend. And in fact, we are going to do this, and where the lag time is uh, with respect to where our PV is in its total process change or PV change. Okay. So in order to complete this closed loop portion of our PID loop here, uh, we're gonna need to get rid of this error and actually implement this DEDT instruction for now. I mean, we're gonna go in there in later videos and actually manipulate the dead time and look at how we can model dead time in our process. Uh, but for now, we just wanna get it initially set up. So how it actually creates dead time or how we actually simulate dead time in our process is we're going to implement this as an array so rather than feeding our pv directly back to the controller as the cv changes which would mean we'd have zero dead time we are instead going to push these values into our array or put them into our buffer and then at some time interval that we define based on the dead time and the delta t setting we are going to release those values back to the controller, effectively creating dead time in our process. Okay, so I hope that's clear. So just a quick recap, rather than feeding the values directly back to the controller, the instant they are changing, which would be a theoretical value of zero for dead time, we are instead gonna push them into our buffer here that we're gonna create. And then at some time interval that we define, we are gonna pop those out of our stack, if you will, and feed them back to the PV. That's how we are going to implement or simulate dead time in our process. So the first thing we're gonna to need to do is create a new tag here for the storage array. And I am just gonna call this DT. And you know what, I'm gonna make it a 100 elements in length for now, okay? And let's just go in here and take a look. So you can see it's 100 elements long, and it's saying one element required. And the reason it's saying that is because of our um, delta t. Let's go back here, sorry. I'm gonna change this delta t to 0.1 seconds now. And now what I wanna do is I actually wanna define the delta t of this loop. We kinda glazed over that. Now remember, the PIDE instruction itself assumes the period in periodic timing mode that we define for the periodic task. And I think we just left it at the default. So I'm gonna go ahead and change that now. So I'm gonna right click on the loop control, go to properties, and I'm gonna to go to configuration. And rather than a 10 milliseconds, which is I'm probably gonna fault a watchdog at some point if we keep it there, let's change that to 100 milliseconds, okay? And click apply and click okay. So I'm gonna go back into my DEDT instruction now. And notice now I have 100 milliseconds delta T that matches our update rate of our loop. And we have a dead time of zero. You know what? Let's just leave it at that for now. We're gonna run initially with a theoretical perfect process with zero dead time, zero lead lag time. And that's it. Notice the error went away immediately. And we can verify our routines and we can save our routine and then we can download that into the controller. So let's go ahead and download that into the controller.
and we'll go back and run mode change yes and so far so good so mind you we haven't set anything up in the pide instruction itself yet but what we've done here now is we have the open loop wired up here we have the closed loop circuit now the feedback loop installed and initially set up for our purposes in the next video what i think we'll do is we'll go ahead set up the scaling instruction and start parameterizing the pide instruction itself okay we're getting closer this is a process i hope i know i'm i'm, I'm going into explicit details maybe overdoing it a little bit in some cases i don't know um, but hopefully you found this video informative and thank you for watching